During this panel discussion today, we were, are going to be learning about building marketing, sales, and customer success plans for growth when it hits your company fast. And today's panelists are all members of BC Tech Association's CEO Growth Council. And, and to kick things off, I want to learn a little bit more about each one of your companies. And so obviously today you don't have to answer every single question. But this is one question that I will make all of you answer. So let's just kick things off. We'll go in the order of people on my screen. Louis, tell us a little bit about what you're working on at Hubly. Yeah, no, I'd love to. Um, so we've been working um, on Hubly for about two and a half years. I started Hubly in my last year of university. But Hubly helps professional financial advisory firms reach their full optimal uh, potential. Uh, by integrating their key processes. If you've heard of tools like Asana or Monday.com, kind of like that, but purpose-built for financial advisors, accountants, tax preparers, lawyers, et cetera. Um, we're currently pre-seed stage. Um, we've raised about a million dollars in funding and launched our product about 15 months ago and have about 400 users with us. So it's been an exciting 15 months of growth. Wonderful. And, and Louis, again, this wasn't uh, in the prepared questions, but uh, can you can you talk a little bit about how you knew that this was a problem that need, not needed to be solved? Yeah, so prior to starting Hubly, I worked at a company called Wealth Simple. If you've mm -hmm. heard of them, um, I helped with, launch their Wealth Simple for Advisors business, where they white labeled their consumer product and sold it to financial services firms. And so got my feet wet into the wealth management space there, have always been obsessed with personal finance and fintech and uh, always wanted to be an entrepreneur. And so it just all came together. Yeah, that's fantastic. Thanks so much, Louis. Um, jumping ahead over to Sean. Um, Sean, tell us about the answer company. Oh, thanks, Roland. Uh, yeah, the answer company, we are a business solution provider. Uh, we are national. Um, I started the company about 27 years ago. So we don't necessarily have that rapid growth story um, in, in all of our 27 years, but you know, about five years ago, uh, we started really expanding and growing our business principally through acquisitions. Uh, today, we're 120 people. We've got a national footprint. Uh, we're starting to expand into the U.S. Um, when we really support small to medium-sized businesses, we have some key partnerships, uh, principally Sage Software uh, and a product called Acumatica. And we really go to market with those, those partnerships uh, to really address um, ERP and accounting uh, requirements for that small to medium business segment here in Canada. Wonderful. And, you know, I have a question for you specifically on, again, the company's been around for 27 years. So it's like pre 2000, basically early internet, I feel like. So maybe in the next question, I'll ask you about what's changed the most between when you started the business and now, but we'll get, we'll hold, hold on to that for a minute. Uh, Sharush, tell us a little bit about Novark Technologies. Uh, so hi everyone. Uh, thanks for them for having us. Um, name is Sprush. Um, yeah, so Novark. We started Novark in 2013. We are a leader in the space of welding when it comes to AI and robotics. Uh, we launched the world's first welding cobot back in 2017. Um, the, the welding industry is facing a massive skilled labor and skilled welders uh, shortage, and our, our cobots help welders to become much more productive. Um, we've been growing at 60 to 100 percent year over year since 2017. In fact, we were ranked uh, twice as Canada's uh, among the top 400 uh, Canada's fastest growing companies, um, even even through COVID. And we are uh, we currently have our customer base is uh, between is, is half and half between Canada and the US. So we we, have, we service uh, two countries at this point. That's fantastic. Thanks for that insight. Um, so let's jump to, again, the question I'm going to ask all of you, but we'll start with Sean, just because I'm super curious, right? And you have a 27-year journey to, to sort of pull from, right? And so I want to know about, you know, what have been some of the biggest milestones along the way in your growth journey? You said maybe it's a bit sl slower or like relative to, you know, Louis, you know, you just raised your in hyper growth room uh, mode, Saroosh. I don't know any company is growing 6,200% year over year, but that's remarkable. Uh, and we'll get into that. But Sean, talk about, again, your company's growth journey. Again, what's been some of the big, the bigger milestones? And also, I want to just hear about like how the web and you know the internet and digital transformation has played into this over the last almost 30 years. Well, first, I need to thank you for making me feel old. 
Um, <laughs> but, but, you know, yeah, I mean, I, we've been in this, uh, you know, in the, this technology industry now for a, a lot of years and we've seen a lot of trends. Like it was, you know, it was client server back in the nineties. Obviously we went through Y2K. That was a mm-hmm. whole, whole thing. And then we, you know, we, you know, there's been, you know, the, the whole dot com push. And really now today we're in this kind of phase of what we're calling the digital transformation as organizations are moving to the cloud. And, and what I would say is we can really tie our kind of our key milestones in our business back to those product partnerships that I was talking about. And really as their products kind of came to market and represented and supported kind of that shift, uh, we were able to typically just ride that wave and just really then it just became about uh, executing you know, a great customer experience as we were helping our clients through those digital transformations, principally moving to the cloud and adopted, you know, ad- adopting connected products and, and being able to really support them through, um, you know, through that, uh, that transformation that they're on. For sure. So a big part of what you, you mentioned were these product partnerships, cloud, digital transformation. Yeah, that totally makes sense. Um, Something we're going to get to later again, just again, struggles, you know. But let's jump over to Sarouche. Again, you've talked about this significant growth that's been happening. And when you're saying the top 400, I think you're talking about the Global Mail's top 400 <laughs> list that they, they just started releasing. I think they did the second one this year. Um, what have been some of the milestones? You know, a, a big customer, a big technological breakthrough. You know, how do you describe some of the milestones over the past, again, you said since 2013, right? So, yeah. yeah, talk about that. Um, I would say the the first big milestone is the first customer in a in a um, in your in our target segment. So uh, we we first we landed our first customer in Canada in 2016. Um, that was a milestone when we sold our first unit in US. Uh, that was another milestone in 2017. Um, I think the next uh, big milestone we had was uh, ship. Uh, well, uh, I would say getting to a point where we have repeat customers. That was a huge milestone for us. Uh, because it, it um, well, we provide a, uh, a tool, a industrial equipment, basically, that has to work uh, 24-7, and our customers rely on them for their production. So uh, making sure that customers are happy with that first investment to a point where they can come back and buy more machines was, uh, was a lot of, of course, things that we need to get right. And we, we, got, that, we got to that milestone in 2019. So uh, I would say that was our... Uh, one of the later milestones we hit, and that was a very important one in terms of a growth path. Wonderful. And um, Louis, I'm not going to ask you the exact same question, but I am curious, again, if there are certain milestones you want to talk about, I know you raised some money, um, but I actually want to hear from all three of you, starting with Louis, about, you know, what does marketing and sales look like? Because you, you all have very, very different businesses, actually. So I, I'd love to hear the contrast between, you know, what does marketing look like, advertising, what is the sales cycle? Um, so let's start with you, Louis, but then I will want to hear from Sean and Sarush about what, what that looks like, because I think there'll be quite a big difference in, in terms of contrast. Yeah, so we're in your B2B software space. And so uh, what that looks like is our average sales cycle is about 25, 26 days. Um, our average contract size is looking at about a $10,000 um, annual contract, uh, mainly recurring revenue. Um, and so kind of the way to think about growth in the B2B software space and what a lot of the best practices are is to kind of think in magnitudes of 10. That's going to be your, your first 10 customers. How do you actually get them in the door? Then it's your first hundred and there's growing pains along the way. Um, we're marching to a thousand now. That's our next 10x journey. We passed a hundred um, a couple months ago. And so that's kind of how to think about in the B2B uh, software space is in magnitudes of 10, we found that that's when you start really experiencing those growth pains quite significantly. And um, for you, like, where's your leverage? Is it more people selling or is it more money spent on like ads? Yeah, so great question. Um, we, so I still do every single sale. So we primarily led founder-led sales. Um, and that's very common in the B2B software space is you have to break your first 100 customers and just rely on founder-led sales. Um, and so we actually haven't spent a single dollar on digital ads. Uh, we've uh, reached a quarter million dollars in annual recurring revenue just basically through founder-led sales. Um, and the way we've done that is just through grassroots credibility um, and guerrilla marketing, basically. Uh, we've built partnerships with uh, financial advisor, uh, professional services networks across the U.S. in all your major cities. Um, and we've basically been 
working with these small communities and creating little mini network effects basically across uh, across the US. That's fantastic. I like that. Thank you for making it to 10, 10, 100. You guys are nearing 1,000. Congrats or, or pre congrats on that. Um, that's fantastic. Sean, what does it look like for you? Uh, well, so our, our, our sales process is typically where, you know, it's, it's very people driven. Um, I am very involved in a, a lot of our sales activity as well. I do think, you know, like, like Louis was saying, like that founder based selling, uh, we're primarily selling to, you know, C-level and, and owners and, and having that engagement is important. Um, we have a fairly broad product portfolio. Uh, so, you know, a sale can be anything from, from 20,000 to 250,000. And, and that does, that does drive, you know, a sales cycle as well. Some sales cycles can be relatively short. Others can be, you know, three month, four month sales cycle. So, but it's, you know, I, I, I think of it as it's very high touch and um, we're, we're ultimately really selling, you know, we're, we're selling organizations on a solution that's going to, going to drive their business. It's going to be the foundation of, of what they're doing. And so there needs to be a, a high level of trust that, that, that both the solution and that partnership are going are, are gonna to deliver on that goal. And, and that only comes from people selling people. It's not something we can kind of self-serve, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. Again, high touch, you're heavily involved. Um, how big, actually, Sean, if you don't mind me asking, how big is your team? Uh, so we've got uh, six people in sales more people in marketing. So, you know, it's not, it's, it's for us, it's a good sized team. Um, we're, we're, we're challenged. I mean, our, our marketplace is, you know, small to medium sized business. Uh, we have some very specific verticals, but also that's actually a fairly broad audience. It's a fairly broad target. Our, the products that we sell um, offer kind of a fairly broad base of, of functionality. So for that's both good and bad. I mean, our, our, our size of market is, is quite large. Um, but then addressing that market uh, becomes a challenge as well in terms of targeting and finding them and, and really getting our story out. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. And, and to Russo, again, you've got this crazy hyper growth story, um, but, you know, it can't be only good things, you know, companies grow and companies have growing pains. Um, I'm, I'm curious, like, there is a line I think in startups, Louis, maybe you can tell me, you know, sales solves all problems. I'm sure you've read that, so, right? You know what I mean? I, I know I've heard that. So Saroosh, can, can you confirm that, that you have no problems or are there some growing pains <laughs> you, you, can, you can share with the group here? I guess the dark circles around my eyes maybe explain a little bit of growing pains. Uh, but uh, yeah. um, a little bit of maybe, uh, just so you guys get a bearing on our sales process, it's, uh, yeah. it's the capital yeah. equipment sales, it's B2B, and the sales cycle is six to 12 months. Uh, price point mm -hmm. is something between $300,000 US to 500000 So it's a very complicated uh, sales process, I would say. It's a complex sales, not complicated, but and there's a lot of touch points and uh, at least five uh, different decision-making units in the process. Um, we've been um, and we've been iterating to figure out the sales process, and now I would say we are yeah we are in a good we, we understand what it takes to sell a unit. Um, and in terms of marketing, we do a lot of different uh, we we employ different methods. So that includes historically it's been more trade shows, but now we are doing more digital uh, ads uh, and more targeted. Uh, so we are in that transition, I would say, but we still do empl employ both methods. Uh, sales definitely for for a startup, I would say sales is the probably the, the most important challenge uh, before you close that sale, and then after that everything <laughs> changes, uh, especially around delivery of the unit and then making sure that customer is happy or those customers and and establishing that reference base uh, for, for yourself and and then. Um, and then your strategy around how you're going to go about uh, technology adoption curve and how you're going to get to the early early majority, right? So that those are the challenges that you have to figure out. Uh, in the last uh, 12 months, many of the challenges have been around delivery and uh, given the global disruption and supply chains, um, how you secure raw parts and how you make sure that your customers get the units and timeline that makes them happy, right? Um, so that, that's been a major challenge on top of the normal challenges. <laughs> yeah, I don't doubt it. Just a follow-up. You talked about digital ads, but you also talked about like $300,000 to $500,000 deals. And I'm, I'm struggling with like, do, how does a digital ad lead to that type of customer and deal? Can you make the connection for us? 
Yeah, absolutely. Good question. So we, you, we employ digital ads to uh, a digital presence, social media presence to generate inquiries. And this is a top of funnel activity. So those, those inquiries then lead to uh, what we call a marketing qualified lead. So we basically qualify that lead, whether it's, uh, it's a fit for what, what we're doing is for fit for, for as a customer for us. From then on, it goes to, to the sales process to become a sales qualified lead or an SQL. And from there goes to an opportunity and goes through different stages of an opportunity before it's closed. So that when I say we pledge a lot, it's really to generate that top of the funnel numbers that we need so that it distilled into the funnel itself as the bottom of the funnel. Hey, that's fascinating. And so Louis, you're doing nothing like that. Um, or not spending online anyway, right? Just to confirm. And then Sean, do you do you do anything related to like the digital marketing funnel? Uh, or is again primarily Sean, like you said, just high touch people conversations. Uh, there's definitely got to be top of funnel activities, uh, but, but in order to initiate the, 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 the mm -hmm. other steps, um, you know, we are, we're, we're leveraging, you know, Google ads, we're leveraging LinkedIn. Like for us, a lot mm -hmm. of our buyers um, are LinkedIn. So LinkedIn is a really great platform for us in order to connect with potential buyers, C-level executives. So we're really, you know, trying to get in front of them, get our story out, um, both, the, you know, our, these days around move to the cloud, digital transformation, and just generate that awareness so that ultimately, you know, they are going to take those calls uh, when they're put in. There's still, there's still an element of picking up the phone and talking to people and, uh, and we need to, you know, create enough, enough um, awareness and enough reason for them to ultimately take those calls. Right, right. And just a quick question for, for all three of you. I'm, I'm curious, what is the digital platform or tool that you find yourself on most? Um, like for me, it's like email. So hopefully it's not that for you, but it could, could be LinkedIn. Sean, you mentioned LinkedIn's a valuable tool. Louis, what about you? What are you, what do you find you're, like, you're spending your time on? Oh, all of the above. Like the <laughs> amount of technology that you have to use to run a company nowadays is insane. Um, I always lose track of the amount of subscriptions we have to pay, but I probably spend a significant amount of time in my email inbox. Um, mm -hmm. And then obviously I'd say the majority of my day is also on Zoom. Um, and so... Yeah, yeah. And what about you, uh, Sarish? Uh, I agree with Louis. Like it's the same, and a lot probably LinkedIn is a tool for uh, finding customers or finding talents. So that's a big one as well. Mm -hmm. And Sean, you mentioned LinkedIn. Is there any other one you'd want to call out? Uh, well, I mean, who, who isn't spending a lot of time in their inbox? I mean, that's just that. That's just a given. You know, I, I I'm sometimes amazed. You know, how, how to how does how how does that inbox get you know a thousand in a day or whatever? It's just there's obviously there's lots of activity, um, but in terms of things that are gonna you know help me kind of create awareness um, for our products and make those connections, um, I would say LinkedIn and then you know other you know partnership type of activities that are often facilitated initially through that platform are are kind of what we're focused on. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I mean, you guys will already have noticed I'm not, I'm not going through the order correctly that we discussed, but I think you guys are cool with it. Um, I want to ask a question sort of similar to what I asked Sarush in terms of growing pains, um, but I want to sort of frame it a different way, which is like, what's keeping you up at night? Is it you can't hire enough people? Is it customer growth is not where you want it to be? I mean, Sarush doesn't have that problem, um, but maybe it's capital. Uh, Sarush, you talked about supply chains. Um, uh, maybe Sean, we'll start with you, right? Like what's keeping you up at night? Is is it people? Is it a changing world? Is it a changing marketplace? Um, well, yeah, what are you thinking about? yeah, i I would say um taking care of our people is what it, it's not necessarily keeping me up, but it's something that's always top of mind. Um, you know, just recognizing that we are fundamentally a a professional services firm. So you know we are heavily rely on, having strong talent in order to really deliver the services that we're, so we're, we're constantly both in that recruiting, always looking mm -hmm. for talent. And then, you know, for me, more importantly, just as an organization, trying to make sure that, um, that, you know, people are, you know, enjoy what they're doing, feel valued. Um, I are, are on board with, with our mission, both our mission in terms of, you know, that customer experience, and then our mission within, you know, corporate social responsibility and some of the other things that we do to layer on top and, and provide kind of additional, you know, reason to get up in the morning. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, totally get that. And so, Louis, I'm trying to think, you, you've not spent any money on marketing. 
you're heavily involved in sales. You're almost at a thousand customers. Um, so what, I don't know, you only have 24 hours in the day, same as us. So, I mean, what's keeping you up at night, right? You need more time, you need more resources. It's, it's a good question. I think, um, I'm just going to add a little bit, uh, Sean couldn't have said it better. It's, uh, the operational challenges and strategy challenges are always easy to fix. Um, the people stuff is tough, but the only thing I'd mm. layer on there is that there's kind of two types of people challenges. One is obviously your, your team members, culture, people that work with you. But I think the other side that I don't think enough entrepreneurs talk about is the, the personal challenges that you face as the, the founder or the, uh, the CEO of the organization is it, it's, it's tough uh, to be uh, the CEO. Um, and it's, um, there's a lot of personal things that you have to deal with as to like, why are you still getting out of bed in the morning to run this organization, work these ridiculous hours? And so I think that's the other thing that keeps you up at night is that your own personal motivation or understanding of why are you still continuing to do this for an extended period of time? Um, and I, I'm, Sean, I'm sure has figured out a lot of this in 27 years of doing this. Um, but I'd say that's the second uh, really tough thing that I think keeps up a lot of founders that I speak to at night. Yeah, no, 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 no doubt. Thank you for that. Um, and I'm going to throw a question out there and you don't, you don't all have to answer it, but I'm curious, who is your first hire and how do you make decisions on which roles to hire for next. And I mean, from like a resourcing standpoint, like now is the time we actually need a marketing person or now is the time we need to hire our first HR manager. Like when in the businesses, you know, life cycle, did you get to that point where you knew you needed to hire like new people? Um, so there's sort of two there, right? Who's your first hire? Tell us about them. But then also it's like, how do you actually decide when, oh, we need to add a product manager or we need to add this function. Like, what is that? Is there a calculation? Is there a best practice? Um, so you all thinking, who wants to jump in on this one? I can add, I can add some stuff there. Um, right. Hiring is tough. Like, uh, and I think we've made a lot, I've personally made a lot of mistakes in that, uh, that arena. Um, and so I think the, the way we think about it now is that it's, it's less about the, the title or the department, but just having a lot of clarity on the mission you want someone to come in to the company and do. Um, and, and a lot of clarity in the role that they're actually going to play. And it's less about I need to fill a departmental role. And I wish there was a spreadsheet or calculation to do, but it's really not that easy. Um, and so the way we thought about it is uh, instead of building a really complex B2B software, what if you simplify the building of a team? And this is what we did in our early days to what if instead we were just carrying buckets of water to our village? And what are the roles that we need to fill in order to be able to supply water to a village that is thirsty? And so what we basically, our first hire is my co-founder and I, I was basically responsible for going to find more drinking water. My co-founder onboards our customers. So he was responsible for carrying the buckets of water back to the village. And the first role we needed to fill was our CTO and we needed someone to build the well, the product that we basically needed to have clean drinking water in. And so that's how when we brought on our CTO, because it was a clear role that we were missing and pe person that we needed, and we needed someone to build and maintain a bug-free well so that our customers could have clean drinking water. Yeah, I love that. Um, and so I could just leave it at that, but you happen to mention that you've made lots of mistakes. So you need to talk about one of those mistakes. Ooh, um, <laughs> which one do I pick? <laughs> I think the, uh, the mistake we made early on is I think it's um, since I was a, a founder right out of university, right? Um, we ended up hiring a lot of people, inexperienced people in our own network early on. And I think um, that the, the, the truth of hire people smarter than you and with experience really does stand true. Um, and I think when I build the next startup, it's definitely going to be higher experience folks that have done it before, um, because there's just, there's so much that you don't know and you need people that have done it before on your team. Yeah. Yeah. No, I got you. Um, Sean, Sarush, do you have a different perspective on, um, again, how you make decisions hiring? Um, or can you tell us, Sean, sorry, I know, I know you're going to think this makes you sound old, but 27 years ago, who was the, you know, who was the first hire? 
Well, so it was, it was somewhat easy um, because I was the selling guy. So I ultimately I needed somebody who would, uh, who would deliver the services. Uh, and so amazingly enough, my, my first hire still works for us. In fact, mm -hmm. I had dinner last night. Um, you know, we really, as an organization really, um, you know, value those, those long time relationships. And, and I would say, um, you know, the hiring mistakes I've made is, you know, hiring is hard. Um, and it's hard to find the right fit. It's hard to evaluate that. In the early days, I, I tried to hire people, you know, that I would trust and often knew them through some, some uh, relationship, whether it was a partner organization or whatever, right? Um, as, as we grow, it's harder to just hire people that I know. So, so then you, you had to kind of go out there and try to, try to define roles and put people into those roles and, and, and be prepared to admit mistakes early. Like that was the one thing that, so if I've learned anything, it was sometimes the fit isn't right. And the harder you try to make it work, the more time you've wasted trying to make it work. And so just, you know, pull the bandaid off, make those, those hard decisions earlier and, and, and just try again. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's an interesting one. Um, we could, we could go deeper on that. Um, I can't, what, what is the thoughtful way to let someone go? Like, how do you have that conversation? I don't know. Maybe, maybe I'm going too deep on that. Hold, hold on, hold that thought. That's an, H, that's an HR question. I, yeah, I, I, I'm not. I'm not <laughs> HR. <laughs> um, uh, Sharush, do you, what about you? Do you remember your first hire? Yeah, um, at the time when I joined Force with my CTO, the next thing we needed to do was to build a prototype of what we thought it's going to work. Uh, and the next hire for us was the uh, the engineering team, the engineers that had to work on and help us build it. Um, so my, my first hire was an engineer and he's no longer with the company. It's been, uh, obviously engineers have to develop their careers, I understand. And, uh, he wanted to move on and learn other things that we could not offer. So, uh, but I've had my own fair share of, uh, hiring experience and hiring. I agree. It's, I agree with Louis and Sean and it's not as, um, it's not a simple task in the, uh, I, I mean, a, a lot of the themes that Sean and Louis mentioned are absolutely great uh, to make. Um, and uh, they're the founder dilemma that uh, Louis mentioned. Uh, okay, you get somebody junior or somebody more senior. Uh, those are traditional founder dilemma uh, that every startup deals with. Um, uh, and especially, I, I would say during uh, the last two years, hiring and recruitment overall and finding the right talent has been more and uh, is getting tougher and tougher especially as you grow the company and you need uh, sometimes specialized talent. And, and part of it is maybe geography, part of it is competition. Um, but those things don't necessarily help you find the right person or, or bring them on board. And, and yeah, it's, it's getting very competitive. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, I, I talk to a lot of CEOs regularly and I've never heard more about how tough sort of acquiring talent has become. And it seems like the last 18 months has made the problem even worse. Um, we'll, we'll be at audience Q&A shortly. And just for anyone who's listening in, feel free to add your, your questions to the, the chat. I guess chat box, I can't see it, but I'm sure it'll pop up if someone adds a question. Um, that's something that I want to bring up as we get to the end here, which is, so you're all, again, growing companies. Um, what is the most likely thing to stunt your growth? And how are you sort of mitigating that? Right. So maybe it's again, like you said, you're struggling for talent. So what are you going to do about that? Um, and so, Louis, I'll, I'll pick on you. What, what, how do you think about that? Right. Like, what's the biggest barrier to your continued growth and success? Yeah, good question. And this one's easy, actually. Um, I spoke to the CEO of Wall Simple, Michael Katchen, and I think he had one of the best answers to this. And I, uh, it's fundamentally true is these, your organization will only grow and scale as fast as you can learn as the CEO and co-founder of the company. And so your biggest blocker is always yourself. Um, and so I'd say the biggest thing that stops us from growing is, is me on a day to day and probably my co-founder. And so the goal for us is how can we learn as fast as possible because we're going to continue bottlenecking the organization um, is, is the, the trouble that we find. And so that's really interesting, right? And so I'm the follow-up then is, is there such thing as like learning 
through like reading books. Louis, I know you're a big reader, or is it really about like you execute, you, you learn, you get feedback, then you iterate, then you do the process again? Is there a faster way? Can you avoid just doing things and messing up? Like, what do you, what do you think? You just need to be insanely curious um, and willing to fail. Um, there's no one way to learn. Um, mistakes are arguably the best way to learn because they those really cement some good lessons. Books are great, but you never you can read something in a book, but until it actually happens to you in reality, you're like, ah, now I get what they were really saying in that book. Um, but yeah, I, I read a lot and I'm just very uh, curious person and trying to always figure out what's next, what's important, um, because I don't want to bottleneck the organization. Great, great. And so Sean and Saroosh, again, maybe like sort of a, an iteration of that question is, um, where do you think the most of your learning has come from? Has it come from building the business? Has it come from mentors or advisors, investors making mistakes? Um, Sean, what about you? So it's a combination of um, watching my peers, uh, other organizations in my in our ecosystem that are doing what we're doing and trying to model you know, what they're doing well, and obviously try to avoid what they're not doing well, and, and then iterate on our own and try to be innovative where we can. Um, ultimately, you know, we're, not, we're, not, we're not building a product, right? right? We're, we're, we're selling and implementing somebody else's product. So that kind of defines a fence a little bit around which we would operate, um, which is good and bad. It, it, you know, we, 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 we know where we need to play and how to, and so then it's always just about fundamentally executing um, well on the delivery side, having those great customer experiences because those customer experiences fundamentally drive that future growth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and Saroosh, what about you? Again, like you guys are rapidly growing and Saroosh, actually tell me, I should have asked you all of this. Saroosh, have you, is this your first business that you started? Um, and how, how has that played into, I guess, your learning and growth journey? Um, so to answer your final, your last question, yeah, this is, uh, this is the first one that's gone this long. <laughs> uh, the <laughs> first one I did, uh, was much shorter, was about a year and, uh, it was, uh, it was a SaaS software for a hospitality industry. Uh, I was fresh out of the, um, uh, Sauter business school at that time with my MBA and trying to figure out what we, what, what do I want to do next? So, uh, I would say in terms of learnings, I, uh, I, I was the MBA program. I, uh, was very helpful and kind of get, giving me the, the basic understanding of how to run a business. Uh, and over the years, depending on like what stage we were in, uh, I've been trying to use different resources uh, uh, to learn uh, what I need to do next. Uh, currently, with the limited time, I mean, the, the growth comes at the cost of having very limited bandwidth to uh, to learn. So the, the best way to learn then is using advisors and partners and their experience, the people that can look from outside and see what, uh, and you can, have, you can having that sounding board that you can share your thoughts and then uh, and you leverage their experience really um, to tell you okay what maybe you're not considering uh, and as time allows I also use some audible books but uh, it's again very um, uh, and it's a lot of unfortunate probably to make more time for it but it's very limited time that I can send on uh, external resources for uh, for learning yeah that's fantastic uh, there are a couple of questions I've seen here in the chat um, let's go with Julius first. Um, so she asked, were you ever dis discouraged and who encouraged you along the way? Um, that's, that's an interesting one. So yeah, I'm, I'm really curious about that, right? So first of all, I mean, assuming you had your ideas for your companies and you went to someone close and you said, hey, I'm thinking about building this thing. Um, were there people who said like, that's ridiculous. Why would you build this? Or there's X companies already operating in this space. Don't do that. Um, so I'm very curious about that, right? And then who have been the people around you who have been saying, like, no, you should try this um, if, if those people existed? Um, so, Sharush, let's start with you, actually. Sure, yeah. Uh, I would say um, because we maybe we were in a bit of a differentiated space uh, and a new product and a new market, uh, uh, I would say my biggest discouragement has been my internal voice of wondering if I'm doing the right thing here. <laughs> a lot of people say, well, that's great. You're building a robot, right? So <laughs> that's great. It should work. I mean, at some level it will work, right? So, uh, and I've been lucky to have a lot of encouragement from everyone around me in terms of my family and um, uh, my parents, my wife, um, 
uh, they're a big part of this uh, because I take all that that's going on at work to home for another eight hours. So them obviously being on board with it was a big part. Uh, but also I've been lucky and being encouraged by advisors along the way. We were part of an accelerator that was very helpful and, and they, they helped us a lot and they encouraged us a lot. I would say our, um, a lot of government programs that we've used and leveraged, um, they've been really a big force in helping us. Um, IRAP, for example, and the ITA program was extremely helpful along the way and very uh, and they encouraged us a lot as well to, uh, to, to go after this opportunity and especially maybe because it was, uh, it's not, um, I would say maybe in Vancouver, at least it's not, uh, it's manufacturing, it's hardware, it's robotics, it's, it's tough, right? It's not everyone's cup of uh, tea. So it's, it needs a little bit, of, it's a longer term commitment from investment side and from people that are working on this project. So, um, and of course, investors that, that we brought on, on board and them really understanding what we're trying to do and what our vision is and then being uh, full, full support of me achieving that, that vision has been a big part of this. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's fantastic. Uh, I, I saw some nodding from Louis and Sean. So maybe you sort of connected with Sarush's, you know, discouragement being himself. I don't know if that's what, what the nodding was from, but um, do either of you have anything you want to add to that? No, no, uh, I would, I, I would just say, sorry, Louis, go ahead. Go ahead, Sean. I don't have anything to add. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, so I've been doing this a little bit longer than the, the other two guys and 27 years, it'd be impossible not to have periods of discouragement. That's uh, and, and, and I, you know, one of the reasons I love my job is, you know, I, I work with hundreds, if not thousands of companies. So I see, I see everything from best in class to not best in class and, mm -hmm. and often get an opportunity to influence that, uh, that direction. So I, I, I get the opportunity to learn a whole lot from a whole lot of different businesses on what works for them and what doesn't. And that's, you know, that's what, you know, kind of gives me, gives me purpose. And so if you can make an impact and you can see that you're making an impact that, that helps compensate for those periods of discouragement or why are you working so hard? And, and, uh, and, and frankly, you know, failure is not an option. So if failure is not an option, those periods are simply, you just move past them and, and you find a different, you know, a different path. Sure, sure. Um, okay, so I think I've got about three questions left. Um, this is a great one from Jimmy. How, how, and, and so you might not have an answer to this. How do you, each of you know this is the one thing to settle all your passion and energy on? Um, and so as, you'll definitely answer these differently. Because Sean, you're like, well, I've been running the business for 30 years. So it, it was, you know, <laughs> you made, made the right decision. Choice. Yeah, yeah, whether yeah, I knew yeah. I was making it or not, it's clearly been made. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. That was been made, but again, Louis, your company's newer. Sorry, she's yours a bit newer. And, and do you know this is the one thing to set all, all of your passion and energy on? Louis, why don't you why don't you answer that first? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question, Will. Like, so um, I was part of the TechStars Accelerator program uh, in New York, nice. and this exact conversation came up. We had um, about a thousand companies apply for their program every single year, and they accept ten. And so um, there were 10 pretty good founders that got accepted into this program, right? Uh, accelerator program. And this exact conversation came up at one of our roundtable chats as CEOs. And I think uh, what we settled on is basically the conversation topic is that there's actually a spectrum um, as an entrepreneur. On the one side of the spectrum, you have entrepreneurs who, who seriously believe that they were born and they were born to basically build this exact company. And they invest all of their passion and energy into this one company because they were put on planet Earth to do that. Um, and then you have entrepreneurs on the other side who just love building things. This is not their first startup and there's not going to be their last. And they're, they're just love the entrepreneurial commitment of building organizations that make a difference in people's lives. And so we had a conversation as to where do you place yourself on that spectrum? And so I think it's a really important conversation to have with yourself if you're an entrepreneur is are you doing this because you're truly crazy passionate about this one idea or are you an entrepreneur and you just love the idea of business building? For me, I'm very much on that side of the spectrum is that I just want to be an entrepreneur. Hubly is just my first stab at a software company. I've built companies before this and it's definitely not going to be my last. And so I think figuring out where you fit on that spectrum um, is really important part of your own journey that you have to go on. I love that. That's a, I think that's a really interesting way to think about it. Um, 
Shrush, what about you? Maybe we just we we sort of use Louis' comments as the foundation, right? Are you are you building the business because this is what you were born to do, or is this you know you you, you like building businesses? All right. I think when you were starting, I think maybe the audience's question is around. Okay, so if I want to do this, how do I know this is the one? Um, the answer is you don't know. Uh, <laughs> I think you know actually for sure. What you need to know is that whether there is you have enough passion and this is a big enough opportunity. And, and at, the, at the time we're making that decision, um, if there's that, that alignment that they see this for whatever reasons, and there's different kind of reasons people start companies, but if, if whether it's having an impact, whether it's uh, the lure of entrepreneurship uh, and you see that, okay, that's what I want to do. And I see that this is, this idea has legs on it. Um, and I want to take that risk uh, really because you're doing that on your human capital. So if you take that risk um, at that point in time, that's a decision you have to make. So it's, it, it, um, and then you would be coming back to that decision throughout. But what I can tell you is this, once you make the decision to go ahead and as you build a company, and that was to my surprise, because I thought, well, I'm going to do this for six months. I'm going to see how, what's, how it's going to go. Now it's been seven years. So <laughs> you, you come back and you look at the road you've traveled in six months after a year, and then you see that, oh, wow, this was like, so much better than I ever thought. Uh, I mean, in my case, it was. It was like so impactful, and I really enjoyed it. And I was like, okay, well, I want to keep on going. I want to, I want to see what's going to come next. I want to be in this journey. It has, a, and it has ups and downs. Don't get me wrong. It's not like you're always going up. You're going to come down. You're going to learn. You're going to make mistakes. Uh, but as long as you're not giving up, and that's another important thing, maybe to Sean's motto of uh, never give up. Uh, with I'm sorry, uh, option is not failure is an option, which I really like. Is that as long as you're not giving up. Um, and you're passionate about it. There's always room. There's a, there's an opportunity there, and and, you, and you're going to figure it out. So that's awesome. Um, all right. So I think I've got room for two more questions. Um, here's this one's a bit forward looking, right? So let's look at the next twelve months. We've just gone through a pandemic and another recession and all this stuff, and it looks like we're coming out of it. But looking at the next twelve months, um, where are you focusing your energy? Uh, hiring launching new products, uh, expanding to new markets. Um, and yeah, you, you can each just answer this one briefly if you want. Louis, why don't we start with you? Yeah, so I'd say it's that March to 1,000. Uh, we crossed the 100. Mm -hmm. And so it's that next 10x. And I'd say the, the second one is um, there's this concept that uh, we like to talk about. And it was one of our advisors told, told, told us about it. But at certain stages of growth, you want to find your next change maker um, that's going to join your business. It's going to either be an investor, an advisor, or a full-time team member. And so um, I'm, I'm working to find that next change maker um, that's going to come in and just fundamentally help drive, transform the business and get us to that next level that we're working towards. That's awesome. I like that idea, concept of a change maker. Um, Sean, what about you? What, what's your focus over the next uh, 12 months? It's really just um, expanding our footprint, you know, so we've we've made a number of kind of strategic acquisitions over the last few years that have broadened our product portfolio and broadened our geographic footprint. And now it's just within each of those markets, feet on the ground, continuing to grow and, and, and just have a greater presence in each of those places. Great, fantastic. And Saroosh, what about you? Uh, growing. So we've been on that kind of growth path and we want to continue this growth. And part of that growth on the sales side would be going into new geographies. Um, but also equally important is to have the infrastructure in place to be able to support that growth, the people, the processes. Uh, so uh, making sure we have the right people in the right seat and uh, making the right decisions and, and people are clear on what process um, should be uh, taken on. Uh, that, those are my big areas of focus for the next 12 months. Fantastic. And I think I only have time for one more question, but let's make it sort of, again, another quick one. Uh, obviously, in these sessions, we like to share strategies for growth with the audience. Um, so the question really is, what is like the big takeaway or like the big strategy that the audience, the members can do right now to prepare for rapid growth? Sarush, you just mentioned making sure you've got the people and the processes basically in the infrastructure to help support that growth. Maybe that's your answer, but I'm just using that as an example. But like, what is like the one thing, if you can take all of your insight from this hour and put it into like a nugget of advice, what would it be? Sharice, why don't we start with you? 
I would say, and that's something again, I and underestimated is uh, processes and, uh, and, and because what, having the right process in place and making sure that actually people are following that process uh, is an important stepping stone to, for you to be able to make that uh, business scalable. And that's what you're really doing. You're scaling up. And if you scale up on a wrong process, mm. it, you're going to fail. Uh, it's like an engine. And uh, it's taking an analogy from the Lean Startup book. I guess uh, you built an engine, you know, it's working. Now you have to crank it at a higher, f- faster speed. And if you don't have that ability to, at, at a faster rate as you're turning that engine, if, it, if you don't have the right processes, it's just going to fall apart. So... Uh, you want to avoid that. And that's where we're in right now, that we're at that scale up phase and we need to make sure that this, the processes are in there. Uh, diff- I'm sure maybe Luis case is uh, maybe earlier in, the, in that he's facing, he has to still make up maybe the engine and the, 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 to make sure everything is working, the developer was in the product market fit is there and all that. So at our stage, it's mainly uh, making sure the processes, the right processes, and you don't want to over process, you don't want to under process, you just have to get the right one. And it's, and, and, and it's an art in itself, like, uh, something you, you need to figure out. Great, thanks a lot, uh, Saroosh. Um, uh, Sean, what about you? Um, again, basically, it's you know, t- take the last hour and put it into a few sentences of wisdom. Wow, um, <laughs> e- echoing on what Saroosh said, it's it's people, processes, and systems. And so I would mm. say that's the one thing that we've been doing over the last three or four years is really you know uh, doubling down on on our internal systems. You know, so, you know, implementing what we think are best in class so that we can then go out to market with a really good story around best in class systems and, you know, and, and kind of uh, tout the benefits of those, of those things. So. Wonderful. And uh, Louis, what about you again? You know, what can people watching really, what's like the one thing, there's actually a really good book called the one thing, but what's the one thing they can take away, right. To prepare for rapid growth. Yeah, I'd just say like my general advice would be to think in quarters. Uh, a quarter is a lifetime in, in, in a startup. And so and you, your goal is to hyper prioritize every single quarter on the, the one or two things that are going to absolutely kill you or it help take your business to the next level. And I, I love what uh, both Sean and Saroosh said around process improvement. It's still what we're, we're still nailing and building that engine. So it's like, where's that bottleneck in that process? what's the thing that we need to hyper prioritize and fix and we spend an entire quarter dedicating all of our team's resources towards fixing that problem um, mm-hmm. and i'd say that's where you need to what you need to do is hyper prioritize and just let some fires burn uh, you can't do everything unfortunately mm. yeah no that, that's oh, yeah that's just it let some fires burn that's why you can't solve everything at the exact same time <laughs> Thank mm-hmm. you.